Today we're going to talk about life after Roe versus Wade. And I know this is the scary topic. There's been a couple of like documentaries. I just watched one on Netflix about what will post Roe America look like. That is the day I am looking forward to and the party I'm waiting to plan. Uh, but today we're going to talk about uh, life before Roe versus Wade and what life's going to be like after Roe versus Wade and what the pro-life movement needs to be prepared for and what you and I need to be working towards. All right, so let's get started. So first I want to talk a little bit about life pre-1973 and Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolt. Now, just to give you a little understanding um, of you know abortion laws, we know that Roe versus Wade legalized abortion in the first trimester, the first three months, um, and then Doe versus Bolt legalized abortion for the mother's health or life uh, with the last the second, well, not the last, uh, second and third trimester, the other two trimesters. Um, what's interesting is that word health uh, that you saw in Doe really wasn't just like the life of the mother. It was her, you know, well-being, her mental health. Uh, and that's what's allowed justification for legal abortion in all nine months for whatever reason. I think a lot of times when the abortion industry talks about our abortion laws, I mean, we know, like when we talk about the extremism of abortion laws in our country, we actually win. Um, the fact that like we're up there with China, Canada, and North Korea for having the most extreme abortion laws. Um, but it's kind of deceptive a lot of times when the abortion industry talks about uh, what we what kind of laws we have. In fact, there, a couple of years ago, there was a Pew poll done in January around the anniversary of versus Wade. And it said, you know, the headline was majority of Americans support Roe versus Wade. And I looked back at the polling question they had asked and it said, you know, Roe versus Wade legalized abortion the first three months. Uh, how do you feel about abortion? And so the abortion industry, CNN, like all the mainstream leftist news outlets took this and the headline was majority of Americans support legal abortion, which is actually not the case. And in fact, a poll that we conducted students for life this January found that once we told millennials, the largest voting block in America, you know, 18, 24 year olds, what Roe versus Wade was and what it did we actually won. We had 51%, I want to say, 51 or 53% agree with us that Roe versus Weed should be reversed and that the decision of abortion should go back to the states like it was pre-1973. We even had more than 60% millennials in our poll this January say that they believe that they should have the right to vote on abortion policy, meaning abortion, uh, the decision of whether abortion, the legality of abortion, uh, they wanted to come back to the states, which is what we had pre-1973 in the Supreme Court and seven men uh, jumping into this mess. Um, so, so before 1973, you had several states that had legalized abortion. Most states did not have legalized abortion. And, you know, often when we're on campuses, I actually got this question the other day at a, a public school, you know, we get, we get asked a question of like, you, you talk about abolishing abortion and you say abortion's wrong, but really, can we make abortion illegal? And I think a lot of people, when they ask this question, I mean, it's coming from a good part, right? They don't, they're, they have good intentions behind asking it. They, they don't want women to die from having a legal abortion. And that's not what the pro-life movement wants either, right? We don't want anyone to die. That's why we're pro-life. That's why we're anti-abortion. Duh. Hello. Um, but I do think, you know, a lot of people who ask this question, they're not necessarily like hardcore abortion advocates and extremists, um, who, you know, wouldn't mind sucking up a baby, um, but these are just people who just are really trying to understand this issue. And so it's a question we get students for life a lot of what about, you know, what happened before 1973 and weren't there tens of thousands of women dying a year from having dangerous illegal abortions. And we don't want that. And I think there's a couple of things you can say to respond to this. I mean, obviously like um, just because something is dangerous doesn't mean it should be legal. I mean, bank robbery is highly dangerous. Armed bank robbery is highly dangerous. It doesn't usually turn out well for the armed bank robbers, but we haven't legalized armed bank robbery. Um, we also know that, you know, and it's true, um, you know, 
passing a law uh, and saying something should be illegal isn't necessarily going to end it. So I've actually heard this from some pro-life advocates recently of like, and I, I think they do it as a way to kind of suck up or become more friendly with those on the other side and say, well, look, we're not really into politics and we're not here to talk about the law. We don't really care what the law says and what's going on. Um, and I think they say that because they want the other side to like view them as their friends. I mean, ultimately, um, I mean, you can, we can try to build relationships with those who advocate for abortion. And I think we should continue to build relationships with those who advocate for abortion uh, and befriend them. And because honestly, like when you befriend somebody, they're actually more likely to listen to you. Our model of students for life is belong, believe, behave. It's not until somebody belongs with, often with your students for life group or feels like they belong with you, that they're actually going to start listening to what you're saying, especially, you know, we're, world changing things, worldview changing things like abortion or faith. Um, so this, I mean, it's a very, it's a blonde believe behave is actually an evangelical like tool for spreading faith. Um, but I've heard this over a couple of times uh, from you know, recent pro-life advocates of like, well, we don't care about the laws and you know, whatever, because laws don't matter. It's not going to end abortion. Let's, so some of our like you can say, someone could argue like that's true, right? Like, you know, passing a law to make abortion illegal isn't going to end all abortions. Like we know that like the 13th amendment uh, banned slavery in the United States and yet slavery still exists in the United States. Now, what it did do is it severely weakened the slave trade, right? There, it really isn't um, a noticeable or visible slave trade. There's an underground slave trade, but it's very small. Um, and the number of people who suffer, uh, the victims of slavery in the United States is, is significantly lower than what happened uh, pre-Civil War in America. Um, and so the 13th Amendment is saving people from being enslaved. Uh, so I would argue that, you know, laws will save lives and it won't make abortion um completely uh unthinkable right some people will still continue to have abortions but it will it will severely severely lower uh the abortion numbers right um and it's going to weaken the abortion lobby because they're not going to be able to legally profit from committing abortions um and continue to spread their crap messaging all over the place and um and influence students and, you know, they're create a culture, a create customer business cycle that they have. Um, so, you know, I think passing laws does matter and passing laws will save lives. Um, and it's going to save a lot of lives. And sadly, we look at too, I mean, look at, um, if you look at polling before 1973 and polling after 1973, you had this like, huge shift in the American psyche, actually, of people who thought abortion was morally okay. Uh, was was actually, They were actually in the minority before 1973, and then it shifted suddenly when the Supreme Court handed down Roe and Doe. Um, a lot of people sadly, and they should not do this, derive their morality from our legality. And we know throughout history as pro-life advocates, obviously, that, you know, we shouldn't be deriving our morality from legality because there's been a lot of times in our American history and our world history where just because something was legal did not make it okay and did not make it moral. In fact, it was wrong and it was immoral. Um, and so, but I, I do think that that, that is important. Um, passing laws do matter because it will reshape, you know, when Roe uh, is overturned, it will get cause people to think about their support for abortion, how they would argue, if they would argue in support of abortion, it will dramatically reduce the number of abortions because, you know, Planned Parents are going to be able to advertise that they commit abortions. You're not going to have freestanding abortion facilities that can advertise and market themselves as, a, as abortion agencies. So you are going to dramatically reduce the number of women who suffer from abortion who pay somebody else to violently dismember another human being. So laws matter, yes. Now, if you look at, you know, the, the claim we usually get on campuses of, well, you know, 10,000 women plus died a year pre-1973 uh, of illegal abortions. That's actually not true. In 1972, there was a CDC report that came out, um, Center for Disease Control, uh, which, by the way, we don't have a national reporting um, standard or requirement in our country. It's complete crap. The fact that the two largest abortion vendor states, New York and California, don't actually even report their freaking abortion numbers into the CDC every year. Um, if you want to get 
accurate abortion numbers. We actually do Guttmacher Institute, which is, you know, formerly they were associated with Planned Parenthood. Now they're separate, but they're still Planned Parenthood's research arm named after the second um, president of Planned Parenthood, Alan Guttmacher, who also, like Margaret Sanger, was a known eugenicist. And I think he was a vice president of the American Eugenics Society. Uh, but that's another podcast for another time. Um, but if you look at a CDC report, 1972 it um i think it was like I, i've got it somewhere on my speeches but it's like 24 women died from uh illegal abortion and it was like 30 some died that year they thought of legal abortion um that's how many women they thought died um bernard nathanson um before he passed away he, you know, if you all know Bernard Nathanson, he was the co-founder of NARAL, the National Association of Appeal of Abortion Laws, and now today it's NARAL Pro-Choice America. He co-founded it with Larry Ladder. Ladder was a biographer of Margaret Sanger. Uh, Ladder was um, a population uh, bomb uh, conspiracy theorist, I guess you could say. He was an ED of the Humor Fund, which believed that, you know, in the 1970s, the world was going to you know, be overpopulated. There was going to be mass starvations. And he believed that abortion was the solution to this, right? Um, you know, pretty pretty nasty guy. So he and Bernard Nathanson co-founded NARAL. Uh, Nathanson later said that it was he and Nate Natter, uh, Larry, Larry Ladder, sorry, who went to Betty Friedan and convinced her to include abortion in a second uh, edition of Feminist Mystique um, because they knew they had to get their movement for abortion within this new women's rights movement that was taking shape. But, but that really wasn't ever the original tent of the second wave feminist. Uh, but that's my feminist talk. And you can, you can tune in on Facebook live when we, when I do my feminist talks on campuses, the lies feminists tell. Um, and I go into that a little bit more in depth, but, but Norm Nathanson he later in life became a Christian. Um, I think he converted to Catholicism, uh, admitted that he committed, he believed about 75,000 abortions in his lifetime. But when he became pro-life, one of the things he wrote, he wrote a couple of books, but one of the things he wrote was that, you know, they grossly exaggerated the number of w women who are dying from illegal abortions because they knew that was a way you know, that was a pain point. That was a sympathy point to get people to say, yeah, I don't like abortion. I wouldn't have abortion, but I don't think women should die from abortion. They, they knew they could get that compassion from the American people. And so they were the ones who made up the number of about 10,000 uh, women dying a year from illegal abortion. It was actually Mary Calderon. She was a medical director of Planned Parenthood um, in the 50s and 60s. She left in 64 to start CECUS the um, sex educate sex information education council which is messed up by the way no people don't know about secus they're not a government agency but they present themselves as one and they are basically responsible for all the comprehensive sex ed in our country and on their website if you go to secus it's s i e c u s their website i think it's like secus.org it says like sex ed is a vehicle for social change um, it's messed up. Um, so we need to do a whole, we need to get Carol Novelli um, on this podcast and talk about Seekus. Um, I'm going to get my friend Karen England on as well. Um, Karen, uh, Karen runs a, a group in Nevada and California that kind of combats and teaches parents how to combat this extreme, crazy sex ed that goes on. And Carol, you may all know, know her, but she's a writer for live action now, but she used to work from our crutcher over at Life Dynamics and was a, like the lead investigator from AFA 21, which was, you know, my off a 21 kind of um, showed kind of how abortion uh, was, was, was presented and how really it was a tool of the eugenicists um, and the eugenics movement it was birthed out of the eugenics movement. So anyway, so Mary Calderon actually in 1959, I've got this article here. She was presenting a paper at the maternal and child health section, of the American public health association, APHA uh, in new, uh, in New Jersey. She was in Atlantic state, New Jersey, and she was making a case for legal abortion. And it was interesting. If you read her uh, speech, she talks about how she, how she actually wasn't for legal abortion. Um, but she wanted to make the case for legal abortion. Um, and she actually said in her uh, article, abortion is no longer a dangerous procedure. This applies not just to therapeutic abortions as performed in hospitals, but also the so-called illegal f abortions as done by physicians. She went on to say that she estimated that 90% of illegal abortions were presently being done by physicians in good standing in their community. 
That's why the death rate was as low as it was. She said the trouble usually arises out of self-induced abortions, which comprise eight, approximately 8%. Um, or the very small percentage that go to some kind of non-medical abortionist. So when you often hear like tens of thousands of women are dying from illegal abortions, that's actually not true. You have it from Planned Parenthood's own medical director in 1959 that 90% of abortions were being committed by physicians in good standing. The dangerous um, abortions were being committed by women who are self-inducing abortion, trying to take herbal remedies or some other poison, or they're going to non-medical quacks, right? Um, it's also interesting here. She, um, she, she says in this, how many children she actually thinks, I mean, how many, not children, how many mothers she actually thinks are dying from legal abortion. Um, Calderon said, in 19, oh, this is another speech. In 1957, she said there were only 260 deaths in the entire country attributed to abortions of any kind, legal or illegal. She said in 1921 in New York City, they knew of 144 abortion deaths. In 1951, and that was down to fifth, only 15 that year. And while the abortion death rate was going down strikingly, strikingly during that 30-year period, we know the abortion rate actually didn't go down. What had happened was the invention of penicillin because before uh, 1973, when women would die from, from abortions, they would die mostly because of infection. You know, that pesky little problem where the arm of the baby or the leg of the baby is still stuck inside the mom's uterus and causes an infection. Um, and Nathanson actually came out and said this as well when he was talking about how he emitted the numbers uh, of, of, of women who are dying from illegal abortions. He says he believes that in the late sixties, it would have been between 200 and 250 a year. So there you go. When you hear that kind of argument of, well, we can't go back, right? We can't go back to a country that doesn't have legal abortion all nine months of pregnancy. You've got, you've got some tools now, hopefully to defend your pro-life position and kind of, uh, kind of correct the, in the accuracies that you hear. And also you can just tell people just go to Google it. Um, it was actually, I was Googling um, in preparation for this podcast today. I was just Googling some articles and I actually came across like this really cool article, um, University of California Press. Um, it's on a book about an like uh, it's called when abortion was a crime. And so they've got the entire book on here. And I was reading this chapter for, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the entire thing, but it actually talks about who was actually punished when abortion was illegal. It was uh, in the 1800s, it was actually men. Uh, men were considered, you know, the reason why women saw abortion. They were also considered the victim, right? Uh, it was the men who had abandoned the woman or made her feel like she had no other choice. Um, and um, the, the feminists at the time, the suffragists, you know, believed, and they believed abortion, they also believed contraception would both lead to male promiscuity, right? Um, that men would just use women's bodies. Sounds like what we have today, right? Um, and then, but they also talked about in this book about how uh, the prosecutions for illegal abortions were actually done, it was on the physicians, that no one really knew uh, illegal abortion was taking place until a woman had a botched abortion, until she was dying and they got a deathbed confession. And then they could go and prosecute the abortionist um, for killing a woman. Um, and so that's really interesting. I spoke with a friend of ours, um, Carol Crossed. She has helped found Feminist Choosing Life in New York. Um, I think it's also called Feminist for non Choices. She's the owner of the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum, which, by the way, if you're ever in, like, Adams, Massachusetts, in the Berkshires, it's totally beautiful. You can go to Susan B. Anthony's childhood home. Um, she Her home is in Rochester, New York, but she was born in Adams, Massachusetts, um, up in the mountains. And you can actually, like, if you're a student, they're always looking for interns, and they, like, help you get college credit. So it's kind of boring because it's, like, a little town in the middle of nowhere. But if you like hiking and out outdoors it's the place for you and it's pretty amazing they have like every um printed um uh edition of the revolution the magazine that susan b anthony and elizabeth candy stanton produced they have it all digitized like they actually have a whole wall on restalism, which was abortion, uh, and th how the revolution was against abortion, and how Susan B. and the first wave feminists, the suffragists, uh, were against abortion. So um, definitely check into that. But I was actually talking to Carol across it not too long ago, and we were talking about illegal abortion and what con our country is going to look like. And she's like, you know, I don't know if anyone realizes, but no woman was ever put in jail. 
There have been some prosecutions, but there have never been a woman who's put in jail for having an illegal abortion. And this is what I'm finding when just reading of, with this um, book online today is who was put in jail were men um, who were believed to have, like pushed women into having abortions or the abortionists who killed women or botched women. Um, so I think that's really, those are some really good tools uh, in, in your kind of mental arsenal. Next time you're having this discussion about, Oh my gosh, what, you know, what's this going to look like? Because really what we know is this is kind of like the scare tactic, right? That we get, we hear from the abortion lobby of like, Oh my gosh, tens of thousands of women are going to die from illegal abortions or they're going to be in jail. Like we have to allow uh, legal abortion in our country. Uh, and so that's just, that really just isn't the case. And a lot of this information that you might have heard is just freaking wrong. It's just like dead wrong. Um, and so we've got to correct this. Uh, okay. So enough about like pre like 1973. Now what happened? So tomorrow, if the Supreme court rules in the case and decides that abortion, it needs to be the decision of abortion needs to return to the States, uh, which would be freaking amazing. Uh, what happens? Uh, there's about 20 cases. There's a Washington post article not long ago. And I think um, Linda Greenhouse just had an article in the New York times kind of reiterating what the Washington post said, but there was a, there was an article a couple of weeks ago talking about how they think there's about 20 cases right now working their way through low, lower courts that could be direct challenges to Roe um, that the court could use to do a, a blanket overturn or can use to severely whittle away, chip away at Roe. I, I think right now, I don't actually even, I'm not even thinking right now that the Supreme Court is has the makeup to have, doesn't really have the will to, to overturn Roe. I think, yes, we do have a pro-life majority on the Supreme Court, thanks to Judge Kavanaugh, thanks to uh, Judge Gorsuch thinks to President Trump, i.e., once again, this is why elections matter um, and why, you know, writing in third party and not voting when it comes down to uh, voting for someone who's going to appoint pro life judges to Supreme Court or not um, matters. Um, but we, we do have a pro-life makeup. The challenge is Justice Roberts, honestly. Uh, and Justice Roberts has a lot of sway for Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, Justice Roberts, while he is, we believe he is pro-life. And his wife is very pro-life. She served with feminists for life for a while in some capacity. Um, he, you know, has said, even when you look at the Obamacare decision and how he ruled with the liberals of the court on that, you know, he actually said, like, you know, I have to maintain order of the court. And so he's all about, like, as Chief Justice uh, you know, maintaining order of the court. And we all know the Supreme Court hates to overturn itself because of that, and then the Supreme Court has to admit it was wrong. Now, it has overturned itself. It's, the Supreme Court's overturned itself about 250 times, a little more than 250 times in our history as a country. Um, so it can overturn itself. They just don't like to overturn itself. And so the question for us has been, What's the case? Would it be one sweeping case or what's going to be a series of cases? I also think, you know, they're not going to want this decision to be a 5-4 decision, which if it were today, it'd be a 5-4 decision. That's why I actually think the 2020 election is going to be the most important of our lifetime. And I know we say that in like every freaking election year, right? Um, but um, it is like we're building towards something and every election is getting, you know, more and more crucial for us as our society and our nation and our republic, to be honest. Um, and so 2020 is going to be huge because I do think we need to get to six or seven Supreme Court justices. Like, I think we're going to I'm pretty sure that they're not going to let this happen on a five four because they know what's going to happen. Right. What you saw in Washington, D.C. with Judge Kavanaugh this fall and the craziness and the pandemonium that took place right and you know oddly enough like two days before the november election a bunch of the women recanted and said oh i guess it wasn't him i don't think it was him but no one covered that and you, but you saw the women like clawing at the supreme court doors the day judge kavanaugh i mean like that was crazy but what you saw with that is nothing nothing compared to what you're going to see when Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat um, with Ruth Bader Ginsburg is no longer on the Supreme Court. Um, in Plan Harris, actually, they just hired a full-time person in D.C. to do, like, uh, emergency rapid response for the Supreme Court. Like, they're already preparing for that. So, like, if you're a person who doesn't like controversy, who doesn't like conflict, I am really sorry, uh, but the pro-life movement is going to get more intense. And that's a good thing because we know change – 
only happens at the point of conflict. You have to produce conflict in society to have change. I mean, President Obama was a genius at this. Um, and this is a very basic Solinsky tactic, okay? Um, but this is something you need to be prepared for. Like, it's going to get crazier. Uh, and this is why 2020 is going to matter. You're going to hear me. You're going to hear other leaders talking about 2020, why the 2020 election is so important. It's going to be over the Supreme Court, baby. Like that is the question because we have to get to six or seven Supreme Court justices to have, you know, have that, that majority of the Supreme Court uh, to overturn Roe. Um, so, but, you know, like I said, there's about 20 cases right now working their way up through the circuit courts that could challenge Roe. You've got these heartbeat bills that are being passed. We talked about that last week. Um, none of them have been upheld yet, but I think, you know, a lot of people are passing them. State legislators are hoping they'll go to the Supreme Court. Um, there's an Indiana case that Governor Pence, uh, Governor Pence, love him. He's over here. Uh, Vice President Pence signed into law that uh, would actually it banned abortions, uh, genetic based on genetics. So saying like if a mother, um, doesn't like the gender of her child, she can't have an abortion just because she doesn't like her child's gender, which by the way, there's two of those two genders, male and female. Um, and it also said that like, if there was a fetal abnormality, genetic abnormality, like my children have cystic fibrosis, Gunnar and Gracie, that you can't have an abortion because of that, which, um, for somebody like me and my family, that that's significant. Uh, Gunnar and I actually talked about that recently and he was pretty upset to learn that, you know, 90% of kids who have CF like him are aborted in the womb, um, as he should be and as anyone should be. Um, so uh, that that may be a case. I, I wrote an article in the USA Today in January on that because they, they're thinking that could be uh, one of the best cases to overturn Roe, this Indiana case. Um, and it's really crazy because then you're going to have the abortion industry and the ACLU and all liberals are actually going to be advocating for genetic discrimination of human beings. Um, and they're going to be advocating for gender discrimination. Um, so I'm wondering how they're going to play this one out. I mean, their goal is they're just not going to want anyone to know, right? Um, so you have these cases going for a Supreme Court. Say the Supreme Court overturns Roe tomorrow. It happens, okay? Gunner is already like planning a huge party for for us at Students for Life. He's on board. I promised my 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 family a nice vacation. The the challenges I kind of lied because that's actually where shit hits the fan. Okay. That's where it's going to get crazy. Now you're not going to have just one battle for abortion in Washington, DC, and you've got state legislation trying to pass. You are going to have 50 simultaneous battles to make abortion illegal. I mean, think about that. We've spent all of our time, money on Washington, DC and like and, and trying to just win on this. Now we're going to have the battle in 50 different states. This is why Students for Life of America was formed because we are a post row organization because we looked around and we realized there's nobody preparing the grassroots of the pro-life movement. Nobody's being trained to lead in the state. You know, I was a part of a, of a right to life group in West Virginia when I grew up. Um, I was in my county right to life group and my, you know, that county right to life group is still existence. My mom is the president and it's like five women. My mom is the youngest woman. She just retired. So she's 62, 63. I don't know if I should say that. Um, but she is like the youngest woman by like 15 years in her group. And they have a booth at the Apple Festival every year, and they raise money for the pregnancy center. They donate money to Students for Life. Thanks, Mom. Thanks for kind of right to life. But that's it. And in many cases, that's all we have across the country is we have, you know, right to life groups with a few older ladies who meet in the church basements uh, who do a, a festival, the Apple Festival or whatever their fall festival is, do a couple of fundraisers. They're not going to be able to go to the state capitol and sleep on hotel room floors and dedicate hours and days to lobbying. They're just not going to be able to do it. They're not going to be able to get out there and leaflet uh, every church parking lot in America every single Sunday. Um, we, we need a grassroots army, and that's why Students for Life was founded. And I talked about this in the last episode a little bit. You know, like I used to tell people we were a post row organization and people thought it was crazy. And I was told like, you got to quit saying that you're freaking people out. You know, they think you're too naive and they think you're too radical. It was like the two like feedback things I got from like the high paid development uh, consultants that I had, I had uh, paid to help me fundraise students for life and grow our mission at students for life of America. Um, and so it was in, it's been so uh, exciting for me personally and very gratifying to see, you know, 
to see this discussion of post row America come up. Cause I was like, Hey, we've been saying it for 12 and a half years. Finally, someone's listening to us. Right. I've done like four or five media interviews since January on what a post row America, uh, is going to look like what we need to be preparing for the pro life movement. I was in an event with Marjorie, a friend who leads Susan B. Anthony list. And she actually introduced her organization as a post row organization. I was like, Hey, you stole that. That's amazing. Like, other people are catching on. This is amazing that now we're talking about this and we're not afraid to talk about this. So one, like just like relish in the moment that we're now finally talking about how we are a post row nation. We're going to be a post row nation. Just relish in that for a second because now all the hard work comes. Okay. Now, now it, it's really rubber meets the road. This is why at Students for Life, like we have this um, metric. We we measure everything at Students for Life. We want to run our, organ our nonprofit like a business. So uh, if you ever want to work for me at Students for Life, just be prepared. Like it's crazy. Um, one of the metrics we have for our staff, for our regional coordinators, for their measure of success to know if are we changing things in the region, are we producing leaders, uh, is our mobilization metric. And that is our regional coordinators have to mobilize students within 72 to 24 hours. That's all the notice they have, three to one day, on a particular issue. So I, sometimes I, I care less about what the issue is. It's always we try to do about Planned Parenthood. Um, so we, we try to focus on Planned Parenthood. So Planned Parenthood's doing a fundraiser at a YMCA uh, or at, you know at the downtown Hilton. Um, if it's a legislative uh, day where we need to go testify, um, when we talked about that in the previous episode, sadly a lot of times it's only us who goes and testifies. But we're doing rapid response. My 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 goal in this event of these events not isn't always just about the actual event that we're doing, right? It's more about how quickly are we able to mobilize students to drop what they're doing uh, and to give us their most precious asset, their time to care about this issue. And were we able to get them logistically able, you know, logistically able to get them there um, and were they willing to do it? Uh, and it's a, it's a big test for us and we're growing our mobilizations and we're actually building our Students for Life groups of, you know, we've been starting less Students for Life groups the past few years because we're actually investing more of our time into growing our existing Students for Life groups, those 1200 groups to make them stronger, to make them more able to respond quicker to things as they happen. Um, and the reason we have this on entire goal is for the day Roe versus Wade's overturned and the day it's reversed and sent back to the States. I actually don't think most students even realize that uh, when we ask them to participate in mobilizations, um, they see that, you know, all oh, this is the task at hand. Uh, but this is the larger vision that we have at Students for Life and why we're doing these things. And so we're already partnering with organizations uh, and starting to kind of do the research of what states are we going to have this big battle in, right? So Roe is reversed. We have 50 simultaneous battles. Well, there's trigger law. So immediately, you know, what's going to happen is, you know, abortion will go back to whatever the, the state had on their books pre-1973. So some states like California, Hawaii, Colorado, New York already had abortion legalized. Uh, those states, abortion will be illegal. Um, there's other states where abortion was illegal. Now, there's states that have passed uh, trigger law. So Arkansas just passed a trigger law this legislative session this spring. Mississippi, Louisiana, North Dakota, South Dakota. So there's five states that are right, right there off the bat where abortion, there's already been a trigger law, meaning when Roe is reversed, the decision goes back to the states, instantly abortion is illegal in states. There was the West Virginia Amendment that, that won this this um this fall. That was a big, one of the big successes that no one talked about. Uh, we believe that's going to be basically like a trigger law as well in West Virginia. Uh, trigger laws have been introduced this uh, spring in Tennessee and Ohio. I think Ohio is getting ready to, or is going to drop it very soon. Um, those are going to be important states as well. Um, so we're going to have a handful of states. I was reading one article uh, just preparing for this and they were saying, I was thinking it was in the Guardian of saying like they think there's 24 states and this is this is an estimate from the abortion industry so obviously they're 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 very scared and keeping tabs on it so I don't really have to um, they believe it's about 24 states that will make abortion illegal when Roe is reversed and the decision of abortion goes back to the states that's huge um, and so then we're then we're going to have to focus on the other states right those are going to be our battles of you know the other 26 states of where do we need to engage and and, and there's going to be states and the, and the challenge is that you know the two largest states that commit abortions new york and california are the two most liberal and those will be the two last states to 
to make abortion illegal. Uh, so essentially what we're going to form are going to be like abortion deserts where there's going to be large portions of the country where abortion will not be available, which will be huge because we know that, you know, the further an abortion facility is away from a woman, uh, the longer she has to drive, the more expensive it is to get into an abortion facility, the less likely she is to have an abortion. And we know this from the abortion industry and the Hellerstadt um, decision, the whole women's health uh, decision that came down, you know, we made the argument was made like, look, these, these abortion facilities aren't upholding, you know, basic ambulatory surgical center standards for care. Like their hallways aren't wide enough for gurneys to get through, uh, EMTs. Um, you know, this is crazy. Like these abortion facilities should have to be prepared in case a woman, uh, starts to die because of her abortion, you know, the procedure that's happening. And the Supreme court actually said, uh, in their majority, uh, decision that was pro abortion that access trumped safety. The access to abortion trumped a woman's safety in having an abortion. That's how important access is to the abortion industry. So these abortion deserts are going to be huge, um, but we're going to have a lot of work to do. Also, it's really cool if you look at the Guardian article where it says 24 states. How many states do we need to pass a constitutional amendment? So, you know, the pro, pro-life pro movement, um, we are not just going to go away, right? So uh, Roe versus Wade is... Um, it's not just going to, you know, Roe versus Wade falls, abortion doesn't go away. We have 50 simultaneous battles. Then what we do is we work towards our ultimate goal in the pro-life movement. Our ultimate goal is a human life amendment. Um, and that's how we're going to get that passed, though, is we need 38 states, three-fourths of states, to be able to ratify that human life amendment. Um, and so you have, if you have 24 states that make abortion illegal, we, we've got to start working towards 38 states. Once again, this is why we've launched Students for Life Action and our C4 organization, because state-level politics matters, people. Like, we have to be engaged uh, in these legislative and in these political fights that determine who, who controls the legislature. Republicans or Democrats, pro-lifers or pro-aborts. Um, and we have to be there. And that's why we've started Students for Life Action, because we have to get to 38 states. Um, regardless of whether or not you start the amendment process in Washington with the House and Senate passing the amendment, and then it going to the states to be ratified, or if you go through an Article 5 in the Constitution and you have the states call a constitutional convention, they pass it, then it goes to Washington. Ultimately, you're going to need these states. Um, and so that is why state level politics matters and why it's so freaking important. Um, so that's a little bit about like our battles of, of about uh, row and post row and where we're looking as a movement to go. I had somebody email me like a nasty email message our day because I was talking about reversing row and decision abortion is going back to the states, how exciting it is for our movement. They're like, you know, that's not our ultimate goal. It's human. I'm like, duh, I understand that. Um, but sometimes I don't give out the entire strategy in the fundraising email, but just saying. Um, so, I mean, that's where we're going. Now, question is the practical. Like, what do we do? I mean, this is the thing that keeps me up at night, you know, like, is the pro-life movement prepared for a post-Roe America? I would actually, you know, say we probably are prepared. I've got some friends who disagree with me and they say that we don't have enough things in place. I actually think we do. We have 3,000 pregnancy centers. There's 8,000 fairly qualified health centers that, you know, do way more services than Planned Parenthood, way more, uh, and serve women for way less than Planned Parenthood, yet they don't make a profit off of her despair. Um, the problem is, I actually think, I think the problem is that of marketing, that we suck at marketing. We spend a lot of time and money uh, making sure donors know who we are or for a pregnancy center community, and there's five pregnancy centers community, uh, making donors think know that we're the best pregnancy center, which is good. I love competition. Don't get me wrong. I am all about competition. That is like the number one thing I thrive on is competition. Um, but we don't market ourselves. Planned Parenthood spends millions of dollars every year taking out billboards. It's usually like a nice white doctor, with pretty blonde hair, skinny doctor. And it's like, we are Planned Parenthood. Here's all the people we've served. And go to this one website and, you know, we'll find all of us. Um, we don't do that in the pro-life movement. We have optionline.org, which is awesome. The Harpy International, thank you, Harpy, um, keeps that in tabs. But we don't spend millions of dollars promoting it. Most of our organizations don't even promote it. I know we have something on our website on it, but 
we're not taking out a multi-million dollar ad campaign every year saying this is the pro-life movement. There's 3,000 pregnancy centers and maternity homes across the country. There's 8,000 fairly qualified health health centers, and we are all here to serve you. And we have every you know need you 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 have we can meet. Um, I think that's our problem is that we're not good marketers of ourselves. Uh, if I had a billion dollars today, if someone handed me a billion dollars, I'm looking for that person. Um, and they said, Kristen, you're the general here of this money. Go ahead and give it out to whatever battal battalions you need to give it out to, right? Uh, whatever organization to get abortion done. The number one thing uh, I would want to spend my money on would be marketing, would be PR. Um, because that's what we need. Like, I know we have these resources. I've worked inside pregnancy, a pregnancy center, not too far from where I grew up in Steubenville, Ohio. If a woman came in and said, I'm having an abortion, but I need this, this, and this, not an abortion, we would have done every single thing she wanted. We would have found the person in the community, the doctor in the community, or the family in the community to take her. And whatever she needed, we would have found. But the challenge is most of the time she didn't even know we existed. Uh, and so I think that's our problem in the product movement. Now, and I know my friend Kathleen Eaton Bravo, she founded Obria Health Clinics, and which is amazing. Obria actually is the first like pro-life agency to ever get money from the federal government. They just got Title uh, 10 funding from HHS. Uh, Planned Parenthood lost out on like – their Obria is getting $5 million over three years, and it's money that used to go to Planned Parenthood, which is – freaking hilarious. Um, and so Kathleen's, you know, proposal to the pro-life movement is that all the pregnancy centers, you know, pregnancy medical centers should come under her banner, Obria. Uh, and then there's one website and they can directly compete head to head Planned Parenthood. And it's not a bad idea. There's other organizations. Um, um, I'm a little biased towards everybody because I do serve on their national advisory boards. So I'll just say that, but there are other pregnancy centers, pregnancy medical centers across the country doing the similar, similar thing. So, you know, like this is happening because this idea is percolating in lots of people's minds, right? Like we need to take on Planned Parenthood and we need to compete with them head to head and we can provide more services and we can provide better services and more quality healthcare. Um, and so I don't know who's going to be kind of like the victor, if it'll be Obria or if it'll be another organization that kind of rises to the top, but um, I pray it soon. And I hope hope um, those organizations are successful because we need to raise that money. Uh, Students for Life is embarking on a um, researching project uh, this semester. And it's going to cost about $450,000, probably half a million dollars that uh, I think hopefully we got the grant money for. Um, but it's all about messaging. And how do we message and how do we mark? And this like this research study is like the first of like 15 research studies I want to get want to get done. The problem is no one in the pro life movement like our organizations are gritty. We're you know we're small and we're struggling for funds and to take money and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a research proposal just like what you know other, you know, what Chevy will do or the big pharmaceutical companies would do uh, or Kraft Foods would do. We're doing what business does. Um, it's it's difficult for us, right? Because I'm saying, going, oh my gosh, look at all the people, all the regional coordinators we could have hired with this money and how many more students' life groups we could have started, how many more student leaders we could form, how many more babies we could save. Um, so it's hard sometimes to keep that, that bigger picture, um, especially when funds are limited. Um, but this is so important that we invest in this and we invest in marketing and we invest in research and how to reach those abortion minded women. I actually think um, that's our number one struggle post row, hands down the day after row, because, you know, we did a study, one of our research polls in 2012. Uh, and it was actually a very enlightening study because that was the one where we, no, I think this is 2008 actually, because we studied uh, we asked pro-lifers what they knew about Planned Parenthood, what they thought about Planned Parenthood. What we found in the cross tabs was actually pro-lifers didn't know what Planned Parenthood was. And so we had lost the question of, you know, do you think Planned Parenthood is good or bad? <clears throat> and what we found was the people who thought Planned Parenthood was bad knew Planned Parenthood committed abortions. People who thought Planned Parenthood was good, people who found thought it was a good organization didn't know they committed abortions. And so it was very easy for us. Like, Oh, as a pro-life movement, we just needed to tell everybody Planned Parenthood is the nation's largest abortion vendor. And what did they know about pregnancy resource center? Like, do you know where to send a friend who's in crisis, pregnant and doesn't want to have an abortion? Like, where would you send her? They didn't know. Even the pro-life students didn't know. And so I think that was very, um, 
eye opening to us. That even pro lifers don't know about pregnancy centers. They don't know about maternity homes. They don't know where to send women. So I was, I would say that you know when we're looking at a post row America and where we're going as a pro life movement, where we need to be investing our money, preparing for a post row America, obviously, and how we support her. Put your money in advertising. If you're a pregnancy resource center director, pregnancy medical center director, it's got to be in the advertising so people know you freaking exist um, because that's how we're going to outcompete Planned Parenthood is saying, look, not only we provide these resources, but we're right here. And by the way, we're like a whole lot nicer. We don't treat you uh, like just, you know, another dollar sign when you walk into our doors. Um, and so I think that is where we need to go as a movement. I, I definitely, you know, there's obviously things we've got to do. I mean, it's just like this whole pregnant on campus initiative, our building better if you're future initiative for high schools. And the whole goal of this initiative is to make sure campuses are pregnant parenting friendly. So no woman ever feels like she has to choose between the life of her child and her education, because there's a lot of misnomers on campuses, even state universities where there's state and federally mandated resources for pregnant parenting women. Most of the time, the women don't even know because the school doesn't talk about, they hand you your condoms at, you know, freshman orientation, tell you to go your way and on the student IDs in California, they're going to have Planned Parenthood's phone number, but they're not even going to tell you you what resources are available for you if you courageously choose life and decide to parent. So there's a lot we have to do in transforming our campus cultures. And we are the one leading the forefront of that. It's the pro-life movement doing that. It's not the pro-choice movement. In fact, when I started my speaking tour, I launched it at Boston College this semester a couple of weeks ago. That was my challenge to the pro-choice students in the audience of, if you're so pro-choice, if you care about women, what are you doing right here? Because this campus is not supporting pregnant parenting women. And I actually had several pro-choice students email me after uh, saying, I still disagree with you about abortion, but you were totally right. We're not doing enough on campus. How can we help? And so actually I actually haven't responded to all those emails because I've been traveling, but I'm really excited to respond and be like, I know how to help partner with the pro-life group on campus, the student's life group to actually get this done and demand your administration do better and do more. Um, and so we are leading the fight in that. And it's the pro-life movement that leads the fight. So don't let anyone tell you like pro-lifers only care about the babies in the womb. They don't care about them in the born. We don't care about women. We are the ones who care about women. I've been inside Planned Parenthoods. I've gone uh, undercover to Planned Parenthoods uh, multiple times. I know how they treat you at Planned Parenthood. And it is nothing. It is nothing like how they treat you inside of a pregnancy resource center. Um, you are treated like gold. You're treated like someone who has a value and has worth. You're not treated like just somebody who is a dollar assigned to Planned Parenthood. So I think that's where we need to go as a movement, uh, where we need to be focusing is, you know, is, is advertising, getting our message out there, you know, beating back Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is a vicious cycle. It's a predatory, create a customer cycle for young people. And we talked about the last episode, some of these laws in Colorado and Wisconsin, I mean, in Washington have been proposed that are going to basically allow Planned Parenthood to come in to write the K through 12 sex ed curriculum, which is going to be ingrained and embedded throughout the whole educational system. They come in early and build a relationship with young people. We've got to be there first. Like we have to build a relationship with her way before she ever meets Planned Parenthood. Because Planned Parenthood's message is cunning. It's like, you know, they don't want to talk about abortion. They know no one wants abortion. It's, you know, when you're ready to have sex, come to us. We'll help you. No judgment. It's free. Um, but they know the sooner she starts having sex, the sooner she walks in the doors, the more money they're going to make. You know, the more birth control pills she's going to take, the more IUD she's going to have. Um the more SD tests she's going to have, more SD treatments she's going to need, and more pregnancy tests, and ultimately more abortions. Um, so it's all about younger and younger with Planned Parenthood and getting her in the door as soon as they possibly can. Uh, so we can we can defeat that. We can get in there. We can interrupt that cycle. Um, but we do it with our resources, our pregnancy centers, our pregnancy medical centers in the communities. And the first step is we have to know. She has to know they exist. So I hope today was helpful. Uh, I hope I was able to give you some tools for when you're talking to people about what post row America is going to look like. I hope you're excited for post row America. I am pumped. Uh, I Yes, I'm stressed out. There's a lot we have to do, but I'm excited for what our country is going to look like in 10 years when Roe versus Wade is finished. Um, and I'm excited for the opportunity that our movement has to get the job done to truly make abortion illegal and unthinkable. 
Thanks, guys. See you next time.